the, the other reason why that's just preposterous, this belief that we hear uh, that that exclude that exclusivity is invention of the white man or invention of the Western world or you know hegemonic entities as mechanisms of oppression. Uh, the reason that's preposterous is the fact that we when you actually look at it, the claims of universalism or the claims of inclusivism, uh, actually they themselves come from the white man. And actually the beliefs of, of universalism or inclusivism actually come from Greco-Roman Stoics, Stoics and, and Middle Platonists. That was actually the first people to articulate the idea of, of what's called the apocatastasis. So the apocatastasis is this term in Greek that, that literally means kind of the bringing back or the, the restoring of all things. And that, that word... Well, thank you for watching another episode of the Jew3 Project podcast. As always, I'm your host, Lisa Fields, the founder of the Jew3 Project. And today we're so excited to have someone who's no stranger to the Jew3 Project, Dr. Vince Bantu. Welcome, Vince. Hey, hey, Lisa. How's it going? It's going great. Uh, I'm, I'm excited to have you on the podcast. For those who don't know, Vince is on our college tour with us, it usually focuses on HBCUs, but we've had a few requests from PWIs, like we really need your work on our campus. We have black students that need to hear this as well. And I didn't even realize, I, I talked to uh, a campus ministry director uh, last week and she was telling me that the Hebrew Israelites are heavy on uh, a PWI campuses as well. So I was like, oh wow, I, I didn't even know that I thought that they were just targeting HBCUs, but apparently they're all over. So they were just saying how how vital the work is on PWIs and HBCUs. So we'll be coming. We hear you loud and clear, PWIs. Um, HBCUs are our primary focus, but we will take some time to do a PWIs just like we did the Kent State event that was a major success. We had almost 400 people to attend. It was a full house and we're so excited to the people at Kent State University and the Campus Ministry Impact at and Neo Impact at Kent, um, Kent State as well. And Vince, along with Sho, are on the tour with myself and it's been a fantastic time we have enjoyed. Um, for those mm -hmm. who aren't familiar with who you are, Vince, give the, our audience a little bit of background before we dive into today's topic. My name is Vince Bantu, as you mentioned, and I live in my native St. Louis. Uh, I live on the west side where I was born and raised. And, um, and I, I do a few different things here. And uh, I, I work at Covenant Theological Seminary, uh, which is the national seminary for the Presbyterian Church of America, the PCA. And, uh, and I do a few different things there. Uh, I'm the visiting professor of missiology. So I do a lot of our courses on cross-cultural ministry um, and excuse me, and on missions. And then I also direct our city ministry initiative, which is a degree program in our master of arts and ministry where students can focus their studies on issues of urban ministry, community development and neighborhood organizing, advocacy and church-based um, uh, ministries of social justice. And we also uh, do different events uh, on campus. And we just had a uh, we just had our annual conference a couple weeks ago. Where we were uh, called gentrification in the church uh, from displacement to beloved community. And we were talking about the role of the church in developing communities and how we can come around residents to empower them to be able to remain in their communities. And so uh, so we do different things like that with the city ministry initiative of that covenant seminary. Um, and then I'm also a pastor of a church, a co-pastor. Uh, at a church called Outpour Covenant Church. And uh, also uh, here, we just we actually just relocated and moved into the West Side in my community. Um, and uh, we're a small, multi-ethnic, multi-economic church. And we're associated with the Evangelical Covenant Church, which is based in Chicago. Um, and uh, and so um, so that we have, you know, we do a lot of great, uh, have a lot of great community and trying to live out some of those very things that, that we teach about at Covenant. Uh, and then another thing that's kind of a new venture that I'm excited to be partnering with you on, Lisa, uh, and several other leaders uh, is um, is we're we're working and and we've just recently opened up uh, really the only uh, academic um, you know institution of theological education on a graduate level that is biblical and is African American. Um, so we're calling it the Meacham Theological Institute, um, named after John and Mary Meacham here, who were pastors 200 years ago in St. Louis, who were teaching slaves theology when it was illegal for them to learn how to read. And, uh, and in the same way, we're trying to bring theological education to our community uh, where it's been in, in many ways still is uh, inaccessible in various ways. So 
Uh, so we just had our first class taught by Dr. Dennis Edwards, who's been on the podcast, and uh, and it was a New Testament survey class, and we had about um, about ten pastors for, show up for their first class, and so we're we're going to be growing it. Uh, it's going to website is going to be out soon, and uh, and we're going to try to be bringing it online and create cohorts around the country where we can bring uh, bibl- again uh, biblical uh, African American. Uh, theological, academic theological education to our community. So that's something that's that is kind of a new thing that I'm really excited about. Um, but yeah, that's just some of the, the some of the the few things that I do in uh, in you know in in my spare time. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I'm I'm excited about um, the graduate program as well. I'm excited to be a part of the board and just helping. Um, and get the vision out and not to confuse any anybody I, I want people to know that there are historically black um seminaries out there um mm-hmm. through howard um and shaw and many others i think mm-hmm. the distinction from the program you're doing is it's uh probably going to be more orthodox theologically mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. Than those of other organizations so uh we That's just right. want to give some clarity um to, mm-hmm. to the to the work um that that we're doing in st louis so mm-hmm. um th- that would be a distinction there today we're going to be mm-hmm. talking about something that probably goes along with that distinction um and is evident in apologetics if it, apologetics is at the core defending faith um and defending the definitive um <laughs> definitive faith um and so we're talking about exclusivity. Um, for those who aren't familiar with uh, exclusivity, can you please explain it? Because people are like, what, what are you saying when you say exclusivity? We're talking about the exclusivity of Christ. What, what, what are we trying to articulate when we say that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think to put it in, uh, to put it in some, some uh, maybe in some urban uh, terms, is that uh, we're we're talking about uh, you know not shacking up. With Jesus, uh, and we're talking about <laughs> or not not having side chicks with Jesus, uh, but we're talking about you know putting a ring on it and being faithful to Jesus. You know, um, you know, I think there's lots of different terms that you know we that get thrown around in theological discourse, um, but but uh, when we talk about exclusivity, what we're saying is that that we're we're going with what the Bible says that salvation is found under no other name under heaven than Jesus Christ. And what that means is that salvation uh, comes through the atoning sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross for our sins, and through the resurrection power um, of you know of the resurrection that got him up out of the ground on the third day. That's made available to us by grace through faith in the in what in Jesus Christ and His Lordship. And so, um, uh, when we say exclusivity, we're saying that uh, that salvation is found only uh, through faith in Jesus Christ. And when we talk about inclusivity or or you know some other terms that get used is like relativism or pluralism that is the idea that salvation for uh for human beings can be found uh through multiple avenues not only through jesus but through the messages of various other religions right um now the inter- now the thing is is that really when you look at it most religions are exclusive in their belief system in some way or 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 another so some people will try to say well you know other religions are more inclusive in their claims than christianity is and i would actually disagree with that and say that most religions if not all have some basic uh you know exclusive claim it just depends on what topic or what area you know um, because if you take hinduism for example well yeah hinduism might be more inclusive or more relativistic uh in terms of their belief on theism, you know, you can have Hindus that are atheistic that they don't even believe in God, uh, or you can have Hindus that are monotheistic, believe in one God, or or a, at least uh, you know a, a supreme God like henotheistic, or you can have Hindus that are polytheistic, believe in multiple gods, and none of them are necessarily greater than another. Um, and so, if someone can say, "Well, Hindus are more inclusive; they 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 believe in different things." I'm like, "Yeah, well, when it comes to theism, they're inclusive, but when it comes to their vision of salvation and their vision of of what we would call as Christians total depravity or, or the human condition or fallenness or original sin, what they would call karma or uh, or, or uh, samsara, right? The cycle of of, rebirth, of death and rebirth uh, being caught in the cycle of, of reincarnation 
Um, and then moksha or salvation coming out of that, uh, you know, through removing oneself from the passions uh, and from desire, which kind of comes into Buddhism as well, that that is an exclusive belief, right? You cannot say you're a Hindu or a Buddhist and say, but I don't believe in reincarnation. Then they're gonna say, well, then you're not a Hindu or you're not a Buddhist because that is an exclusive belief to that particular religious system. So all religious systems have exclusive beliefs. Um, and I would argue that, that any attempt at trying to be inclusive or say, no, actually, various claims can lead to the same path of salvation, that that is much more of like kind of a modern or postmodern belief system, or that comes really from people, honestly, who often are not very steeply, uh, not really deeply steeped in, in any particular religious system, and are just kind of on the surface level trying to say, oh, everybody's saying the same things. But actually, when you get a bunch of people who are deeply committed to their faith tradition, and they're having respectful interfaith dialogue, part of that uh, part of that conducive interfaith dialogue is the recognition that we don't we don't really believe the same thing. I mean, you know, uh, but we can still be cool. We can still work together. We can still partner for the community. We can still have a relationship, but we don't agree. And actually, uh, it shows greater respect when you identify the the differences and the distinctions of saying that no, your your belief system is unique and distinct. Um, and so, but but again, pluralism and, and relativism is this idea that all roads lead to salvation. That different paths are really saying the same thing. Uh, now, universalism would be a totally different thing, which, uh, especially as it manifests itself in Christianity, uh, the it would be different than both exclusivism, exclusivism or inclusivism uh, slash relativism slash pluralism. Uh, but universalism would be the belief that that Jesus is the only way, that he is the only path to salvation, uh, but that that path is made available to everyone. So it's the idea of the restoration of all things, that all people, all creation will be saved, but only through Jesus Christ. So they would they would agree with the exclusivists, us, and say that Jesus is the only way, uh, but they would also kind of combine it with inclusivism or relativism and saying that that is for everybody, uh, but only through Jesus Christ. And so those are kind of just some of the basics of the, you know, kind of some of those, those terminologies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> Actually, uh, for those who don't know, this is something that we haven't announced yet, but there will be market cal calendars for September the 3rd um, for a courageous conversation in Chicago. Details coming soon. Well, we will have the various uh, viewpoints there where we will discuss this. Uh, you can register, get your tickets. I'm pretty sure people are going to come out uh, to see the conversation. Uh, it'll be one of six conversations that we're having that we will be announcing soon uh, with some pretty uh, amazing uh, panelists and scholars and uh, pastors and thought leaders from across the country are all going to be in Chicago on September the 3rd for our, our first national G3 Project Courageous Conversation. So I'm just putting a plug out there for that. You'll see more information coming soon, so be excited. Um, so as we talk about this, um, one of the things that comes um, that I've heard in conversations with people, I've heard lectures from people who are, are African-American scholars who believe and embrace um, either Christian universalism or inclusivity. Um, they talk about this kind of idea that exclusivity is a white man's ideology. Um, mm -hmm. I know you've heard it. We've talked about it. Um, several times that to embrace a exclusive claim is in fact not something that is consistent with uh, the ways in which early church thought about it. Uh, they would point to the fact that they would say the early church uh, before Augustine, um, I think that's one of the people they point to, uh, made a definitive claim of exclusivity that the church fathers before him kind of embraced universalism, Christian, this idea of Christian universalism pointing to people like Origen. Um, what are your thoughts on that when you hear those claims? Yeah, uh, that's, I think that's a great question, um, especially bringing up Origen. I think that's definitely one of the primary uh, early Christian thinkers that, that we have to engage when we're talking about this question. But I mean, to I guess to start it off, I would say that my thoughts on that question are exactly the opposite of what this common belief that we, as you said, as we hear from many African-American scholars who ironically are often actually not patristic scholars, but tend to be more theologians and ethicists and people that are more kind of, their their area of expertise tends to be more in the modern uh, kind of theological world, uh, but they're not specialists in late antiquity, but they just kind of have imbibed 
this, uh, this narrative that actually when we look at primary sources is the exact opposite, that actually um, the, the, the gospel message, which is exclusive in its nature, uh, that salvation is found only in Jesus Christ, uh, is, is something that we see in the New Testament, and it's something that we see in the overwhelming majority of all cr early Christian scholars and thinkers um, before the fourth century. Uh, and, and, act and not only that, uh, it, well, uh, again, all, the other point about that is that the, you know, the earliest Christian scholars and thinkers were spread out throughout the known world. They were in Africa, they were in the Middle East and Asia, and they were in Europe, and all of them embrace an exclusive gospel, that Jesus is the only way, that on, salvation is only made available through Jesus Christ. This is what people of various ethnicities, various shades all believed. Um, and uh, from an early and from an early standpoint, it did not start with Augustine. It did not start in the fourth and fifth century, but this is from the very beginning, from the first and second centuries and in the third century. Uh, that's number one. And number two, the, the, I, the, the other reason why that's just preposterous, this belief that we hear uh, that, that, exclu that exclusivity is invention of the white man or invention of the Western world or, you know, hegemonic entities as mechanisms of oppression. Uh, the reason that's preposterous is the fact that we, when you actually look at it, the claims of universalism or the claims of inclusivism, uh, actually, they themselves come from the white man. And actually, the beliefs of, of universalism or inclusivism actually come from Greco-Roman Stoics, Stoics and, and Middle Platonists. That was actually the first people to articulate the idea of, of what's called the apocatastasis. So the apocatastasis is this term in Greek that, that literally means kind of the bringing back or the, the restoring of all things. And that, that word uh, comes up in the New Testament one time in Acts chapter three, when Peter is addressing the crowd and talks about the, the time at which God will restore all things. But pretty much any New Testament scholar will tell you that 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 is that should not in in Acts three we no one can 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 claim that Acts three is a claim that God is going that Peter is saying God is going to restore every created being that's ever existed. But that actually, when you look at the Greek and uh, the the use of the genitive case after the word times or chronos, when you the, that 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 verse should actually be translated as the 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 times of the restitution of the things of which God spoke, as in the time in which God will restore the things he spoke of, as in his people, his chosen people who have been brought into the covenant relationship with him through faith in Christ. Um, and so, uh, so, so, you know, nobody, no New Testament scholars are going to say that, that the use of that word in Acts 3 is a uh, support of the universal belief. Um, but later, people like Origen, uh, people think maybe did use that term in the same way. Now that's another important point is that Origen's beliefs are not clear. And even Origen scholars will tell you this. Uh, one of the best resources on Origen is um, Elizabeth Clark, who is a professor of early Christianity at Duke, uh, who wrote uh, like a classic seminal text on Origen. And, um, and, and you know, uh, Dr. Clark and various Origen scholars will tell you that, that his views are very debatable on, on, on multiple issues, it's not just the issue of apocatastasis, which is something he did talk about. But you know, some scholars will look at certain points of his writings, like in the, the dialogue with Celsus, the pagan Celsus, uh, Contra Celsus, or his systematic theology of on first principles, and in some of his uh, exegetical uh, works, uh, the Hexapla, all the different things that he's written, uh, because he wrote so much, um, and because he was a genius and like most geniuses, uh, they, their thoughts can be scattered and kind of not sometimes clear. Uh, there are points in his writings where scholars will point to say, look, right here in his writing, he seems to be saying that all things will be restored. That that, uh, And then, but then another scholar will say, yeah, but look at this text. He seems to be saying that they won't be and that, that people do go to hell. And so it's not clear even among scholars what Origen actually believed on this issue is, is point number one uh, that's, that's important to look at. And he also, dabbled with the idea of the pre-existence of souls. Um, and he also, uh, some people will say, may have believed in a subordinationist theology or that he might have understood the son to be subordinate to the father. But even that is a very live question in Origenus scholarship is, did Origen believe that the son to be divine? Uh, and, and if he is divine, was he on the equal level of the father? And you can make arguments either way in his writings. That, again, in different points in his writings, he seems to indicate both sides of that argument. So Origen's, Origen's thoughts are not clear, number one. Number two, his views, or even the parts where he seems to indicate that he might believe in the apocatastasis, um, are 
very much a minority view, a minority belief system. And again, during his own time and uh, going after, but before Christianity became like trying to, the Roman empire tried to take Christianity under Constantine and say, this is ours now, long before that, Christians from Africa, from the Middle East and from Europe rejected uh, his teachings. And that's why even to this day, he's not considered a saint, even in any in any particular Orthodox or Catholic church. And he's not, you know, he's, he's considered a doctor of the church because of his the, theological uh, uh, profundity, but he's not considered a saint because his teachings are problematic and his teachings were rejected uh, like 300 years after his life at the second council of Constantinople in the mid sixth century. Um, but again, because people will say, well, that was by the white man, <laughs> you know, uh, by the Roman Empire, by the, the church councils. But again, before the church councils, his his writings were rejected, uh, you know, by the majority of other Scot other Christian apologists, uh, even in his own native Egypt. Ale uh, Origen was from Alexandria in Egypt, and even other Egyptian Christians rejected him. The Pope of Egypt, Demetrius, actually cast Origen out, and Origen left Egypt and was cast into uh, into Palestine, and that's where he lived out the rest of his days. He was kicked out of Egypt. And so even many people in Egypt did not agree with Origen and his views on things. And then even later on, uh, especially um, when you get into the native speaking, uh, Coptic speaking Christianity, which was not influenced by Hellenistic philosophy or Greco-Roman uh, kind of you know society that that even the native Egyptian Christianity rejected Origen's teaching as well. And the greatest Christian writer in the history of the Coptic language was Shenouda the Great, who lived from the mid fourth to the mid fifth century, and the and he he wrote more than any other author in the history of the Coptic language. And he really articulated and contextualized the Christian message into the Coptic language and culture, especially in southern Egypt, where the culture was different than in Alexandria. Alexandria's up on the Mediterranean coast, and and it's really uh, very much like, uh, you know, a very Hellenized, very Romanized kind of context. Whereas in Southern Egypt, you get more of the indigenous Coptic kind of uh, flavor, which you even see that kind of dynamic today in Africa. If you go to Africa today, when you're in the big cities, uh, when you're in Johannesburg or when you're in, uh, uh, you know, uh, some of the bigger metropolitan areas, you get more of like a globalized kind of colonized culture when you're hearing most people speak colonial languages but when you go out into the villages you get the more kind of un-europeanized less decolonized type of cultural uh, influence you see the same thing was happening back then and so um and so even shenouda uh wrote a very long treatise that was called against Origenus. And and he he was going in on these on these views, which again, going back to point one, it's not even sure if Origen himself really held these views, but um, his own native Egyptian uh, people uh, who were even like contextualizing theology more for native Africans in Egypt rejected the belief of the pre-existence of souls, rejected uh, you know the subordinationist theology, but said Jesus is fully God and fully uh, fully human. He's on the same level of the Father, and um, they, Shenouda and other Coptic Egyptian Christian writers fully rejected the idea of the apocatastasis or the idea that all souls will be saved. Um, so, uh, so, so these are native African Christians who, um, who had been dying for the faith uh, ever since day one. Egyptian Christians and North African Christians were some of the first ones to be persecuted by who? By the Roman Empire. So, th you know, this, this is ridiculous because they'll say uh, exclusivism is an invention of the white man and uh, it was imposed on people later on, but all the early Christians were universalists before and nothing could be further from the truth. If you look at all of the early apologists, Irenaeus and his against heretics, he goes through and names all of them. He's, he's arguing against the Gnostics. He's arguing against Valentinianism. He's coming again. He's saying, Jesus, the gospel is the only way. This was Irenaeus. This is like 200 years plus before Constantine. Uh, Justin Martyr, who like Irenaeus was from Turkey. Uh, these are Middle Eastern people. Justin Martyr writes uh, in his apology on the supremacy of the logos and also argues for an exclusive faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, Justin's uh, pupil, Tatian the Syrian, right? Not Tatian the Roman, not Tatian the white man, Tatian the Syrian also wrote in Syriac and taught, and, and which was later translated into Greek and talked about how the, uh, the wisdom of Moses was greater than the wisdom of Homer. And he went against and rejected Hellenism and rejected Greco-Roman theology. And he argued again for the exclusive faith of Christ. Tertullian, who was a North African uh, and who also espoused a Montanist uh, indigenous African uh, version of Christianity at a time when North African Christians were some of the main ones being killed for the faith by Romans. <laughs> so, 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 uh, 
paganism and, and heresy and oppression of Christians came from the white man in the first few centuries. But what was happening in Africa among Africans, it was orthodox biblical theology that they were dying for, like Tertullian, like Perpetual Felicity, like uh, the Egyptian Christians who were being persecuted for the faith under Diocletian before the time of Constantine. They were the main ones dying and, and defending the faith when they were being persecuted by the Roman culture. And that leads to the third and last point, which is that Origen's idea of the apocatastasis, which is just one of many other heresies and, uh, and false teachings, did not come from uh, African and Middle Eastern Christians. It came from Stoics from like 300 years before the time of Jesus. The first use of the apocatastasis in the way of understanding it to mean the restitution of all things, uh, where all matter will be realigned back to the stars and the planets, which is part of Greco-Roman uh, pagan philosophy, was articulated by Stoic philosophers like 200 years, 300 years before the time of Jesus. So origin and the idea of the restitution of all things is actually being influenced by the white man, by the Western world, by the Greco-Roman Hellenistic world. He is taking and appropriating a Hellenistic concept and trying to apply it to Christian theology, which comes from a brown skin, Middle Eastern, Aramaic speaking uh, people group of which Jesus and the early apostles belong to. And so again, it's the idea that all things are coming uh, back to you know restitution and universalism. That very idea comes from Greco-Roman philosophy, not from the scriptures, not from the theology of the people of color who were, who were the earliest Christians and the earliest Christian apologists who all believed well before the time of Nicaea, who all argued for the exclusive faith of Jesus Christ. And I think that's very, very, very helpful uh, because like you said, the the picture is painted that it's exclusive exclusivity claim was something that started with with Augustine um, and also that it was also something that's a byproduct of the Reformation um, and the picture is painted that it is something that conservative evangelicals uh, use as an oppression and mechanism to further oppress people especially throughout slavery. Um, and that to be intellectually honest and to be um, uh, kind of uh, theologically astute and understanding the text means that you embrace a more um, inclusive um, theology. Uh, but what you're articulating is that there were, were Africans way before uh, the fourth and fifth century who embraced exclusivity and those who didn't, it was a problem. It wasn't like we all, like I, I saw a status, especially when it came to what's happening with the Carlton Pearson movie that said, you know, there was no um, conflict between the early church fathers, um, that they didn't really push back on Christian universalism, uh, that they kind of were, but they were against other things and named other things heresies. And that wasn't called a heresy, until the fourth and fifth century, and which you're sharing, that's not the truth at all. Not at all. Um, I mean, you know, again, Origen and his teachings were rejected even by his contemporaries um, in the third century, and, uh, and even in his own native Egypt. And and again, you already have all of the earliest apologists uh, made it very clear that um, salvation comes only through belief in Christ. Uh, and that um, and that any other heretical movement that claims any you know anything contrary to the gospel claims is false, right? So that that in and of itself shows an an exclusive uh, belief that Christians had. Uh, and then even outside of the uh, the Greco-Roman world, even if we go into Persia, right, outside of the purview of the Roman Empire, you know, modern day Iran and Iraq and and Afghanistan, that they were also combating universalism on another front, which is called Manichaeism. And uh, and Manichaeism was a belief system that was started by Ma Ma Mani, uh, who was a Persian, uh, who was a Persian leader in the third century, in the in the late second and early third century, who he started his own religion that was also universalistic, where he understood himself to be the reincarnation of the Paraclete or the Holy Spirit. Um, but he also said he also would argue that that you can follow that he was the reincarnation of Krishna and Buddha and 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 then later on after Islam his followers understood him to be uh, kind of you know uh, the 
the next prophet in the succession of prophets after Muhammad. And so he basically tried, Manichae, the Manichees were a major world religion that started in Persia, but they spread all the way out into China and all the way into uh, across the Middle East and into Europe and into North Africa as well. They were all over the world uh, in late antiquity and even into the medieval period. And they were very relativistic and pluralistic. They, in fact, the analogy that Manny uses or is used about him in his biography, uh, which was written in the third century, was that he uh, he's like a river and all of the other rivers flow into his river. And so the river of Buddhism, the river of Hinduism, the river of Christianity, they all flow together into his one river and they all come together. So it is a very pluralistic mentality where, and that's why one of the reasons they were so successful and widespread, because they would go into different cultural contexts and it would go into China and be like, oh, Manny is actually Lao Tzu. And, and so Taoism would kind of embrace it and fuse with Manichaeism or Buddhism or uh, Hinduism or, or you know all these other religions. Um, and it was a very pluralistic religion. And one of the things, this gets into the conversation about pluralism, one of the things about Manichaeism, uh, now they were very much persecuted, which is wrong and messed up. But one of the reasons they were persecuted was because of the fact that they kept trying to go into all these cultures and say, we all believe the same thing. And actually our leader, Manny, he's just the reincarnation of your God. And so you, you can, you know, you can practice. And so everyone didn't like these people. <laughs> like Hindus didn't like them, Buddhists didn't like them, Taoists didn't like them, Muslims, uh, you know, Christians. So this is maybe a, a, an early example of a pluralistic religious movement that ended up dying out and it's now extinct. Um, because again, most people do not uh, operate that way where they're saying, oh yeah, we all believe the same thing. They're like, no, we actually don't believe the same thing. Um, and, and, you know, we don't have to pretend like we do to have peaceful and respectful dialogue. And so, uh, but again, Christians who were living uh, around Manny uh, in the third century also rejected his theology. And Afraha, uh, who's known as the Persian sage, wrote one of the first systematic theologies called the Tahwitho or the Demonstrations. And that's a text that was written in Syriac from a Syriac Persian cultural context, completely outside of the purview of the Roman Empire. And here also in Persia, and then later on, uh, just a little bit after Afraha, Ephraim the Syrian, uh, who also lived in the Syriac speaking world also rejected Manichaeism uh, as well as all other kind of religions. And both of these Syriac speaking, uh, uh, you know, Middle Eastern Christians who were really operating in a culture outside of the world of Nicaea. I mean, the, the Council of Nicaea didn't even reach the news of the Persian church until like almost a hundred years after it happened before the time of, and Afrahat's writing before that, but he also rejects Manichaeism. He rejects the idea that all of these religions come true in Mani or in any other pl pluralistic system. But he makes clear that salvation is made exclusively only through uh, the, the crucifixion and resurrection of, of Jesus Christ, only through the gospel. So again, like Afrahad is another example that is writing uh, even, you know, uh, before the time where Nicene Christianity is kind of making itself uh, kind of the dominant tradition. And this is, you know, this is a point uh, that I made in the article that we published on the website uh, about how Ephraim the Syrian contextualized Nicene Christianity. And he actually rejected a lot of their terminology um, that because because it's true. A lot of these people, they are thinking about the ways in which exclusive truth uh, and and the, the and the exclusive truth of the gospel was eventually uh, taken by the Roman Empire, and then later the Holy Roman Empire in the Western world, and and was used in the European colonial project to as a as a as a mechanism uh, as a religious uh, kind of icing on the cake of the political and social and economic and geographical uh, colonization and oppression that your various European powers wrought upon Asian and African and native peoples all around the world for hundreds of years. And of course, we have to acknowledge that this was uh, evil and it's not the gospel and it's and it was wrong. And, and unfortunately for us as African-Americans, that was how the gospel was first introduced to us. But we have to we have to be able to look past that and say that wasn't the totality of the story. And what many of these European people were doing was not the gospel, was not Christianity, uh, but it was actually the idolatry of their own kind of white supremacist identity that really they were just putting Christianity in the employ of their true religion, their true idol, uh, which was white supremacy, which is still happening even with many you know people in our own country. They call themselves Christians, and you know that's and that's something that goes all the way back to the time of Constantine in the fourth century in the Roman Empire, when P even Peter Brown will argue that in the same way when Christianity came into the 
Roman Empire and they decided to make it a Roman religion, uh, it really was kind of a uni unifying religious factor that would be in the service of Romanitas and establishing a universal Roman religion, which was ultimately the Roman people's and Constantine's ultimate priority. And Christianity just became another mechanism of, of, of creating that Roman unity. Um, but again, uh, we have to be able to acknowledge those things and say how they were wrong and how it's not real true Christianity. But we also have to be able to look at the fact that there were people like Afrahat, there were people like Shenouda, there were people like Ephraim the Syrian and, and Ignatius and, and Irenaeus, Tertullian, uh, Justin Martyr, all of these people who were African and Middle Eastern Christians um, and, and many of whom were writing outside of the influence of Greco-Roman theology. I mean, we have to go to those scholars because even lot, like you said, even a lot of these people, they'll go to Augustine. Well, Augustine was, he was, he was trained, he was, he was, you know, trained by reading Cicero. And he was also very Romanized and Hellenized in his thinking and his education. So in a way we are further exacerbating white supremacy when every single argument we use even to try to debunk it is from Westernized people like Augustine who wrote in Latin. Why don't you read, uh, why don't you read the uh, Ethiopian Synaxarian where you have Yared, who was the saint of Ethiopia in the fifth century, who was pushing out uh, Roman pagan, uh, Ethiopian paganism and pagan religion freely. The, the king of Ethiopia, Izana, embraced Christianity as the dominant religion in Ethiopia in the 300s at a time when the Roman Empire was Aryan. And, the, and, and Constantius tried to impose Arianism in Ethiopia and the Ethiopian king rejected it and embraced Orthodox Christianity. So again, you you know whether it's Arianism, the belief that uh, th because that's another argument that's made. Oh well, the divinity of Christ was invented by Constantine and it was imposed on 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 black people. No, actually, uh, when Ethiop when when Christianity first came into the most ancient black African kingdom, they were defending the faith of the divinity of Christ and were rejecting the Arian theology that was attempting to be imposed on them by the Roman Empire. So again. We have to look at the modern history, the last you know five, 600 years of what's happened to us as a people and our ancestors, but we also have to look beyond that. And when we look beyond that, when we go back to the earliest centuries, we see a time where uh, paganism was rampant in the Roman empire um, and even heretical theology was coming out of that context. But we see African and Asian and Middle Eastern Christians who were defending Orthodox faith. And that was no different in, in this conversation about universalism and inclusivism, which was again, you know, mainly uh, was 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 uh, pri 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 primarily articulated through people like Mani, who was a heretic uh, in Persia, or Origen, uh, who was also not well received even in his own home country. And it's not even clear exactly if that was his belief. And uh, his contemporaries, who were Egyptians, rejected his theology even in the third century, before the fourth century. Um, which is why he was one of the reasons he was exiled. Uh, and this theology of universalism that Origen was was dabbling in, it actually came from Greco-Roman Stoics and not from, uh, you know, it, long before Constantine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's very helpful. I love how you make the distinction of how people, those in North Africa receive Christianity and those, how, how we receive Christianity as African-Americans, uh, because I think that's vital and not to get the two uh, mixed up and mm -hmm. understanding that there is a distinction there. And I also think it's important to note that because when we talk about like liberation theology, um, which I'm thankful for a lot of the groundwork mm -hmm. that uh, Dr. Cohn put in and um, I'm saddened to hear about his death, but he mm -hmm. did a lot of helpful work for us, especially in his works uh, mm -hmm. like the Cross and the Lynching Tree. That's very, very helpful, helpful resource that we would recommend. Mm -hmm. That he's writing against, um, he's he's struggling with not only conservative theologians, but liberal theologians as well, white liberal theologians mm -hmm. uh, that were racist. I know that um, um, Samuel DeWitt Proctor talked about his experience uh, with uh, racist um, deans at Duke and how they mm -hmm. didn't want him to preach. Uh, mm -hmm. when he first was there because they didn't realize that he was black. So I think it's intellectually dishonest to paint the picture that only conservative evangelical Christians uh, were racist. Mm -hmm. And not mm -hmm. on the other hand, talk about the fact that liberal theologians were racist equally uh, mm -hmm. and perpetuated some of the same ideas. So 
to embrace liberalism as a idea, as a theological idea, as it as if it is a cure for racism, mm -hmm. I think it's problematic. Um, mm -hmm. Because there were races on both sides, if we're going to mm -hmm. be fair. Mm -hmm. um, That's right. So I think it's important to note that as we're talking about this, mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, there's still, I have friends that are at some um, the, the schools that, I mean, you, you experienced it on both sides because you went mm -hmm. to um, Princeton, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you went to um, uh, Gordon Conwell, so you mm -hmm. you've been in conservative evangelical spaces, and you've been in more mm -hmm. mainline um, spaces mm -hmm. and studying, and so you know that it's racist racism in both in both organizations. So That's right. it's important to note that um, mm -hmm. as we're talking about this, just to to be more to be more honest about what's happening, and neither embracing either theological construct free mm -hmm. you from racism if you're not applying the love your neighbor ethic and mm -hmm. looking out for those on the margins um, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, fully. So um, I that's think that's right. important to note as well. That's right. And I would even like draw a comparison to, uh, to that point as to, um, you know, really the, and this is something we're exploring in our book project, uh, that we're, you know, that we're that we're getting ready with um, various African American uh, biblical, you know, Orthodox uh, scholars of theology that we're, you know, going to be working on with you three, um, which is the the reality that uh, we don't uh, not just scholars, but you know, many of us who are African American Christians, uh, and I would even say this, you know, would be applicable in many other minority communities as well. We don't fit into the boxes that many white uh, you know, theologians have created between, you know, liberal and conservative or, or fundamentalist or modernist or evangelical and uh, progressive, whatever the adjectives you use. We, again, uh, at the end of the day, uh, there's white supremacy and, the, and there's uh, patriarchy in all of these systems and that they, uh, neither one really speak to the reality of the black church, which is inherently holistic. The, you know, black Christians have not had to wrestle with the binary that white theologians have created between, well, is it justice or uh, social, uh, uh, or is it justice or biblical orthodoxy? I mean, this is some of the great work that Show Baraka and other folks with the Anne campaign are doing is showing that it's both of these things. And this is something that, again, uh, African American Christians have always understood that 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 it is the uh, liberative um, message of the gospel that has been at the heart of African American spirituality from the very beginning. And that liberation is not only liberation from uh, social justice and, and it's liberation that leads to freedom, but it's also liberation from human sin that we all need through the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ and that it's not one or the other. Um, and so that's been the holistic faith of African-Americans from day one. But I think that, um, you, you know, uh, it's unfortunate that we're in a context now where uh, because, um, and I, to your point, I experienced this as well. Liberal, liberal white institutions have invented this theology that's saying, well, it's more about human, uh, you know, social gospel and not, not a, you know, uh, but orthodoxy is an invention of the white man, so to speak. And so and it, it's usually white liberal scholars who said it first and then black scholars are coming behind them saying, oh yeah, that's, that's and this is black theology. It's actually, just like Origen got his universalist ideas from Stoics, most Black scholars who call themselves, you know, uh, you know, kind of progressive or call this black theology, a lot of times actually came from European and white American scholarship even before that. Um, which, as to your point, there was a lot of helpful things that needed to be said about uh, about the racism, both in, to your point, liberal uh, and conservative white circles, and also the, and also I, I'm so appreciative of Dr. Cohn and his his positioning of trying to, you know, trying to relocate the conversation around social location that that theology speaks to us in our context and that we approach theology from our context, uh, and that the universal arc of the gospel bends towards justice and God identifies with the oppressed. All of these things are extremely uh, powerful truths that Dr. Cohn and others who have he's influenced have helped us to see. Um, and so, uh, but it's just, you know, it's also just disappointing that with that, with so many, uh, you know, black theological scholarship that there also comes these, these ideas about um, biblical orthodoxy and the gospel message and and like what we're talking about today, the you know the these things that aren't even historically substantiable, uh, uh, substantiable that that um that the idea of universalism or was the dominant idea and exclusivism only came later that that's not actually true. Uh, and when we actually look at the primary sources from Africa and from the Middle East uh, from the first, second, third centuries, we see that that's not true. And so I would almost, but I would almost liken that 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 um, that 
that that binary we have between white liberalism and white conservatism, uh, that both of which are problematic and don't speak to, because in many ways, uh, white liberal theology doesn't speak to the faith that black Christians have, the exclusive unwavering faith we have in a historical risen Jesus Christ. Uh, but at the same time, so much of white evangelicalism doesn't speak to uh, our experience and, and, and is also heretical in many ways because it doesn't uh, speak to the dignity of black people and, and stand with us in issues of injustice and so and systemic racism and and all these kind of things and so uh it's it, you know i mean first john says if you claim to you know if you see a brother need and don't have pity on them how can the love of god be in you and so so we have to have orthodoxy with orthopraxy and again uh again that's holistic in the black church in in the united states for the history of for our you know 400 year history and in the same way in the ancient world uh, you had kind of a similar binary between uh, you could even equate this white liberal theology to like the pagan culture of the Roman Empire before Christianity that was inclusive. We believe in all kind of gods, right? That it's inclusive um, and it's liberating. The Romans thought of themselves as a light to the dark world. But yet, who were they oppressing? They were oppressing African Christians for believing in Jesus, right? And then, but then even after Constantine, this is the other point that they don't want to talk about. Uh, a lot of these people who are saying this was invented by Constantine, they have to remember the fact that after the Rome, the Christianization of the Roman Empire, most of the African and Asian Christians were exiled by the Roman Christian Empire because they had a different theology. And so they were also oppressed by Christians, who be other people who claim to be Christians. And so we could equate that to uh, the lack of support and the, the tension and the oppression that many uh, people in the dominant culture who claim to be Christians still participate in with our community. And so in just like in the in the early uh, in the early church world, you had African and Asian Christians who were holistic in their faith, who understood the exclusivity of Christ and the liberative aspects of the gospel and who were being persecuted by Roman liberal polytheistic people for believing in Jesus, for having exclusive faith. And then later they were persecuted by Roman Christians for having the wrong faith. And so it, you see the same dynamic happening today with many uh, Christians of color who are holistic in their faith. And we are sometimes ostracized by uh, white Christians for, again, not having the right faith, the, the faith that they might have and, and set up as the dominant faith. And in the same way have creeds and have particularized language that if we don't speak and use the same code words that they do, just like what happened in the early church councils, then other Christians are exiled and seen as heretics. But at the same time, we're exiled and seen as uh, uh, archaic or or antiquated by by liberals who claim to be inclusive, but they're inclusive of everything except exclusive claims. <laughs> and, and, and again, when you are dealing with human beings, uh, mm -hmm. I would argue the vast majority of human beings believe in something they hold to be exclusive, um, and uh, and 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 will oftentimes still participate in paternalistic ideas like, well, you guys just got that from, and even other black scholars say, well, you've been brainwashed by the white man, and you've just been. Uh, you know, influenced by them, denying the, the possibility that people are actually just educated, uh, intellectually autonomous beings who have freely chosen to believe in this exclusive gospel that comes through this brown skinned Palestinian Aramaic speaking Messiah named Jesus Christ, who himself said, no one comes to the father except through me. And many other black and brown and white Christians in the early church all believed on that. And that was, that was not an invention of the Roman empire. Uh, it was an invention of origin because he got it from Stoics, uh, but it was an invention of, of of believers who most of which were of color. I think that's, that's definitely very helpful. And I, I, I think, you know, to, to be fair to uh, scholars, I think the lack of exposure that we all have to early African church fathers and the knowing of those like you're talking about their writings in their language um, hinders us from being able to uh, understand fully what they believed. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that speaks to the educational systems we have and mm -hmm. how there's a lack of exposure to those things. So people are really just working with the tools that, mm -hmm. they've, that they've been given and coming up with these thoughts. Uh, the benefit I think of your work and what makes you an anomaly is that that you're really intentional about reading these early church fathers in their original languages, learning the languages, and and that's something I think that I'm so thankful for your work for, because if if not, we would just have kind of what the the textbooks were were given uh, 
Mm -hmm. Unless we, we uh, dug a little deeper and had that specialty. So I'm thankful for, for your work in that case. As we close, for those who are um, thinking through exclusivity, what books would you recommend for them? Yeah, um, I think, again, I mentioned, uh, just to kind of clarify um, a little bit about, you know, what's, what people have kind of just on a surface kind of skimmed and and made assumptions about people like origin and their belief system. I think again, Elizabeth Clark book on origin and the originist, I think will help understand how complex uh, and, and you know, his views were and his writings are. And so it's not exactly uh, easy to just kind of pinpoint, excuse me, a, um, a particular view of his. So I think that would be a real helpful one. And then also, um, also I think that, uh, you know, the, the writings of Shenouda would be really helpful to just see a, uh, you know, again, see an Orthodox Egyptian, um, in some ways we could even say it's like even more Egyptian than Origins writings in some, in, you know, in some cultural and linguistic senses. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think the translation of Shenouda's writings that that, uh, that we find in, you know, the select discourse, there's some, you know, modern English translations out now where some of that includes some of his writings about against Origenism, I think would be a helpful support to see how, again, even, Egyptian native Egyptian Christians were speaking against, um, you know, the uh, the teachings of of origin on this very issue, the apocatosis and things like that. So, though I think those would be some some resources that uh, you know, that would be helpful. Mm -hmm. how can people get in contact with you on social media, Vince? Yeah, um, I you know I'm on Facebook, uh, you know, Vince Bantu, and um, and and also on Twitter, uh, and um, you know, I also uh, would you know love be People can find me on the website of our church, Outpour Church, um, uh, outpourstl.org, uh, or also at Covenant Seminary. Uh, I'm there as well. And uh, you know, if anybody, um, if anybody happens to be in the St. Louis area, uh, you know, Lisa and I will be uh, on August first and second having a workshop on African American theology. Is you know, kind of dialoguing about some of these very issues that we were seeing and. And then also we'll be together again in Chicago on September 3rd. So people definitely uh, hit us up on that. And then um, and then just, you know, be on the lookout for um, our website coming up. If any, you know, people are interested in theological education through Meacham Theological Institute, that'll be coming up soon. And then uh, also uh, my my book uh, will be, you know, I'm working on a working on a text that will kind of get into some of these issues about like, you know, kind of why Christianity is seen historically, why Christianity is seen as a white man's religion. And then, but then also introducing us to some of the, some of the early, um, earliest examples of Christian theology in the, in the non-Western world. Um, so that people can just kind of be familiar as, to your point about how this is so uh, kind of understudied and, you know, not, you know, not really promoted in a lot of, even a lot of schools and seminaries. So be on the lookout for that. Hopefully that should be out, just turned into manuscripts. So it should be out, you know, hopefully soon, but, um, but yeah. Yeah, I'm excited. Yeah. Um, college tour is still going on. So look for that mm. in the fall and for fall and spring dates as well. We'll be coming up soon. So we have a lot going on. We appreciate all mm -hmm. the support we're, we're getting for the G3 project. All your emails and messages are greatly appreciated. We are thankful for them and we are continuing to provide content and resources. We're working in talks on a curriculum um, that we'll be we'll be working on. Hopefully, be out in 2019 um, for churches um, for apologetics in the Black Church. So we're doing a lot of work uh, under the radar, uh, but we will have some exciting announcements for you soon. Thank you so much mm -hmm. for your prayers and support, and thank you for watching another episode of the Jew Three Project podcast.